Hello, my name is Isa and I would like to invite you on a journey through the book of Habakkuk in a series we have titled The Conflict and Triumph of Faith. In this five-part series, we will look at the dilemma that Habakkuk had at the beginning of his book and at the end we will see his great confession of faith. We do this series in response to the time we are living in as we see how the scriptures affirm our faith in God, how the scriptures show God's sovereignty, how we can put our faith into action, and finally, how this faith affirms our confidence in God. Welcome to this series. Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. My name is uh, James Nganga Mora. I am born again. I am a pastor at uh, Nairobi Baptist Church and I'm also a focus associate. Uh, I want to invite you in a special way to, for us to look at scriptures, uh, devotional sharing from the book of Habakkuk. And today we are going to do Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 1 to 11. And allow me to read uh, Habakkuk chapter 1, the first uh, four verses. This is what the word of the Lord says. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear, or cry to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me, strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth, for the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. Uh, allow me to reach at verse 4, and uh, but we are going to share uh, all the way to verse 11. Habakkuk is a record of a dialogue between God and this prophet concerning the wickedness of the people of Judah and the impending judgment that was supposed to come through the hand of the Babylonians. And this, in this uh, dialogue, it's a question and answer. It's a place where Habakkuk raises concerns and questions to God, and then God in return responds. And that's how the book is all about. Uh, verse 1 and verse to verse 4 is Habakkuk's cry. Habakkuk is raising a concern to God, and he, according to him, thinks that God is too silent. God is far removed from the realities on the ground, and he is not acting. Habakkuk is raising a cry of help to God because of the crisis in which his people are, especially because of the wickedness and their sinfulness. And in his view, God is not acting, or he's not acting as swiftly as he, he thought. He is raising a complete against the silence of God, and he is asking God to respond to his questions. And I see these things uh, like he is asking in two, uh, two areas. One is about the personality of God. He is wondering why God does not respond to the cry of the oppressed. Does God really see? Is he aware of how much his people are being tortured and tormented by the evil that is happening in the land of Judah? Is God concerned with the afflictions of the righteous as David calls them? So is God really aware of what is happening on the ground? And why isn't he responding if he is aware? The second one is about the holiness of God. In a way, Habakkuk is, 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 is asking, God who is holy and righteous, why are you allowing evil to prevail without you taking any action? The wickedness of the people of Judah, according to Habakkuk, have piled up to the heavens, but God does not seem to respond. Yet God is known to be the righteous and pure God. Corruption, violence, idolatry have increased. People have messed everything. The covenant of God has been broken. The law has been ignored. And there is a lot of uh, lawlessness in the land. And God seems not to be caring. And I'm sure that we have those why moments. We ask questions like, why did I lose someone I loved? Why did my relationship break, which I thought would lead to a happy ever after? Why isn't a job opening coming as soon as I thought? 
But this is the kind of response that God gives from verse 5 to verse 11. I'm calling it a very unpopular uh, response. Again, it's the claim that God could be indifferent and impersonal and far removed from the affairs of the earth. God reveals to Habakkuk through that response that he is actually aware, that he is concerned, and that he is committed. God is not impersonal. He sees, he hears, and he responds to the cry of the righteous. To prove this, actually God has a plan to respond to the individual needs, to respond to the national crisis of lawlessness. According to, you know, God, uh, Israel is a nation that is set apart for God. God is going to respond. Also, his response is going to touch the nations because he's going to use another nation to punish uh, or rather to impose judgment on the people of Israel. So God gives a very unpopular response to the question of his holiness. He is using a wicked nation, that is Babylon, to judge a less wicked nation, that is Israel. Now, God is a standard of holiness in this case. He's the Israel, is, Israel as a nation is not the standard of holiness. God is going to use another force. And later on in this book, we see even Babylon itself, those, uh, they are sinful. God uses them, but he again brings judgment upon them. So God is the standard of righteousness, and he is committed to ensure that his plans are, 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 are accomplished in the earth. His response implies that all people, all events, and all circumstances are God's tools and processes that he uses to accomplish his divine plan. That is why he's going to use a more wicked Babylon to judge his people. And really, that's about God's sovereignty. My conclusion is this. God is watching. God is aware. God is concerned. And God is committed to his plans. Let's trust that through faith, God is going to make everything work according to his own plan and time and purposes that he has for each one of us. That one requires us to have a lot of faith and trust in him. Trust him in the process, trust him in the end, because he is a faithful God. God bless you.